Welcome to the um, next in the video lessons on why Hitler and his regime managed to stay in power without much resistance or instability. Uh, we're looking at that material interest and sometimes the phrasing of this factor confuses people. Um, so what we mean by material interest is simply people don't support or uh, encourage or avoid resisting Hitler because of some high-minded intellectual reasons, high minded ideological reasons, propaganda or anything. It's just because they see it as a pre quo quo, i.e. they see they get this from the Nazi state. You know, uh, usually they get this financially or they get these um, goods or they get this prov these provisions from the Nazi state and it's better than it was under Weimar so they might as well go along with it. And although this seems quite prosaic and quite fairly um, uh, selfish and basic, I would contend this is actually a very, very important point to explain why the mass majority of Germans at least consent to the regime and allow the regime to carry on existing. So this factor puts itself alongside the many of the other factors that we're going to be looking at over time. We've already looked at terror and we're now looking at how it's the terror. Is it that um, average Germans see that their lot in life, particularly against the backdrop of the Great Depression and the failures of Weimar to deal with the economy long, in much longer term, um, they see that, that at, least, at least Hitler, at least the Nazis have managed to fix the economy and at least their, their quality of life is improving. And how much goodwill and willingness to go along with Nazis that brings. So um, an important thing to think of is that um, in reality, support and stability is not dependent on everyone loving you. Um, we've talked about this before, the uh, concept that um, the um, vast majority of German people do not find themselves throwing bombs and bringing down a state, nor they find themselves worshipfully loyal to the Nazi state. They are like most normal people, in somewhere between consent and conformity. Well, material interest, unless the Nazi state significantly um, improve your lot in life well beyond your expectations. What we're looking at here is generally the uh, material interest stuff leading to consent. People going, well, you know, I don't mind ideology, but like Nazis are good for Germany, or at least good for me, and we might as well keep going because about everyone else I've seen. Um, a very often material interest to generate that consent works in combination with factors. So you can, for example, foresee having terror, that low level conformity, better not lie, and better not um, say anything bad about Hitler, um, combined with, and also to be fair to him, he has improved the, uh, the, from the Great Depression, combining in that sort of material interest terror way to gain, gain a level of consent from a large chunk of the working classes, for example. So when we write this, we're not writing to show why does this material interest lead to people loving Hitler. Obviously it, it will help some people love Hitler, love Nazism. It's more like how does it generate this sense that of a social contract between the state, the government, Nazis, and the people. I, I don't like necessarily everything they're doing, but they're better than the others. And for in that case, I would say material interest, if you brand in that case, is absolutely vital. Particularly when you point out that actually some groups are massively have massive benefits than others. We've already talked about the impact on the army um, uh, and how they're rearmament. And um, if you're not sure about that, we need to go back to those lessons. Um, and we've talked about some variations um, in uh, the rights can call up for the church. We're going to be focusing much more on the economic stuff for the other classes we've yet to mention. A key thing to also think about, obviously, is the change over time. 1933 to 36, people have lower expectations. Why? They've just had four years of the Great Depression. If you manage to make the the um, uh, graphs go point upwards rather than downwards when it comes to GDP, incomes, unemployment, whatever, apart from unemployment, um, then you are already doing good. So people's low expectations means you don't have to do very much to give people the, the their a sense that Germany's improving materially under the Nazis if people start having jobs. Absolutely fine in and of itself. In addition, um, in this period, um, Hitler is very important to do this because um, he's trying to gain a sense of legitimacy. If he can show himself as the one leader after those many have failed who can do the Great Depression, um, it is therefore very useful thing to make him stand out amongst compared to other leaders. This is something Hitler really prioritizes and this is why material interest is very important for Hitler in the first three years. As time goes on however, Hitler is balancing material interest against rearmament and increasingly from 1949 fighting a major war. And we can argue that material interest increasingly declines, particularly for after 1942 when literally you are being bombed by the RAF and US Air Force. Um, 
and most of the resources are now going and fighting the total war. Um, uh, uh, most resources of the state are both focused on that to harness the same material interest matters there. So it's important to remember the period of time and the impact of Great Depression um, of uh, material interest will shift gradually downwards over time. Doesn't mean it's not important, but uh, still means it's significant. So when we look at um, the, this trend, this really mirrors what is going on economically, and there'll be a lesson in the future about economic policy. But for now, what we need to think about is in between 1933 and 36, the priority for the Nazis is economic recovery. As mentioned, this is because the Nazis were voted in off the back of the Great Depression. The four other governments before him, Müller, um, Brüning, von Papen and Schleicher, to a greater or less extent, showed themselves have failed to deal with the crisis and inertia that that created both politically and economically. The Nazis came on the platform, therefore, to deal with the communists, to deal with the Great Depression. All resources focus on that. Even though Hitler would love to start rearming and start a war and, um, earlier, he is realistic enough to know that his legitimacy descends from his ability to fix the Great Depression. After that, 1936-39, we see the shift towards rearmament. Um, when money is being spent on rearmament, then um, obviously this money is not being spent on um, uh, investments, is not being spent on promoting economic growth, and not being spent on improving material um, circumstances of the Germans. Um, in 39-41, um, this continues uh, ever so slightly more, although it's worth bearing in mind that because Hitler believes it will be a quick war, partly because Hitler wants it to be a quick war, because economically and politically a longer war is still a little bit difficult um, the although um, the amount of hit that the average German takes in the terms of their material circumstances their incomes their rationing and so on is actually less than other countries Hitler Nazis um, don't ration uh, until properly until well after this period whereas the British start rationing during 1939 um, and so that's really really important and then when we get to 42, 42, 42, 45 the Russians are coming we have a total war economy where pretty much every resource in the state is focused primarily on winning the war and therefore there's less time and money for the sort of stuff that will improve people's material lot in life the idea is we need to win the war first and then we'll go back to improving the circumstances um, so before we look at the sort of specifics it's well worth um, l l uh, making sure it, we understand that in the 1933-36 period, this man, the Heimar Schacht, who was initially the president of the Reichsbank, uh, becomes Minister of Economics in 1934, um, who, is, although who is a member of the Nazi party after he gets appointed, um, because it looks good, um, but actually was, not, was a member of the elite, not the Nazis, uh, for a series of um, essentially creative accounting, which is, Mefo bills and public works projects, which is where essentially you stimulate demand by providing employment to people doing certain things, for example, building autobahns, as you can see on the right hand side of the picture, um, or digging ditches, or just working in general stuff, which um, is less about what they're doing, it's more about the fact that they're doing work and getting paid for it and they're getting money in their pocket to spend in local businesses and so on and so on and so on. We've talked about the public work projects before. Um, and um, uh, the public work project schemes, you you can look up in your own time, the um, various canals and various um, autobahns. Um, it's well worth bearing in mind that um, between 1933 and thirty six, this promotion of Keynesian economic theory, or elements of Keynesian economic theory, um, where, where we see massive rises in government expenditure, which increased by 70%, um, and we see huge public work schemes, uh, which are paid for by the same government expenditure, um, ha does help promote that positive multiplier effect. Essentially, it creates demand for local businesses and local communities because now you have a bunch of people who were unemployed and not spending money, spending money. That then means businesses are a bit more stable, means they're more likely to keep retain and hire staff, more likely to buy and sell stuff, the factories that make the stuff, more likely to sell, buy and sell stuff. And this sort of very crude summary of what the multiplier effect continues. Um, farmers are protected and subsidised. Um, uh, by the state, which helps stop the, at least their um, decline, economic decline, which if you remember from 1921, they have been in economic decline and depression since that period. However, it's well worth bearing in mind, this, um, the, this system is not recklessly or completely divorced from orthodox economics. Taxes remain high. Um, so it's not, f uh, so it doesn't go full on like reduce taxes on the poor and only tax the rich. Um, and also the, the traditional sort of German values of saving and thrift are still encouraged, even though you kind of want people to spend. 
<clears throat> so it's not a perfect picture. It still has sort of vestiges of leftover orthodoxy and sort of traditional views on the economy, but they, they don't really actually make a significant impact um, on um, uh, on the overall recovery. So what you need to think of is the government, it, public work projects are good, but how comes the, the with the taxes running high, um, the massive government spending and the saving um, encouraged, as well as the protectionism in um, farm, for farmers, how come the, the economic improvement still happens? Well, the first thing is there's enough of that sort of Keynesian um, stimulation of demand in the public works projects and, and rearmament spending and uh, increasing renew, uh, bringing back of conscription, which again is another way to give poor people who don't have jobs money um, uh, in Nazi Germany. Um, there's enough of that to really promote that recovery and I think you know we, we, although there are costs there is still clearly some promotion and another must thing is the, the nadir the bottom of the world economy comes in the late winter uh, um, 1932 which means that Hitler comes to power exactly when the, the Great Depression internationally has hit its rock bottom and what we see therefore is that he is he is presiding over a period where the rest of the world is also improving as the rest of the world improves their economy as the rest of the world improves um and um, after the great depression they're more likely to go back to buying german products drawing things from german businesses and uh, investing and providing loans and therefore that will also help externally completely beyond hitler's control um ensure that the um uh, improvement and the recovery increases in addition, wages are deliberately kept low because trade unions have been abolished and replaced with the DAF, which is the German Labour Front, which, being a Nazi-controlled institution, is not going to aggravate for economic policy that people don't um, in a Nazi state do not want. In addition, because they are a totalitarian regime and because they um, ha therefore have... Um, unlike liberal democracies, they have the ability and are happy to in intervene in prices. They can also control the prices of goods, for example, foods, for example, uh, raw materials, in order to make it a little bit more um, attractive, should we say, um, and also to make sure that people have the basic necessities um, that are required. And by controlling prices, therefore, they can ensure that German goods remain competitive, that, that the workers have their uh, the foods that they need and that the farmers aren't completely um, done in by low prices. Um, it's well worth bearing in mind though but a lot of these sort of um, positives and factors we need to positive for short term. There is a lingering balance of trade and a balance of payments issue where the um, the government is trading, buying in, importing far more than it's exporting so buying more than it's selling um, but also it's also um, it is spending more than it's taxing and this creates a problem in the short term it's fine you've got you can get loans or you can get mefo bills um, but in the longer term it starts becoming an issue um, and often many historians say argue it's part of the factoring which means that the war is encouraged as a means to sort of address this economic <coughs> time bomb um, because if you uh, invade another country you can take its stuff and that fixes that problem to some extent so in this period therefore we see a massive improvement in the economy, um, it's uh, six unemployment goes from 6.5 million to, down to 1.5 million. Although, remembering that the Nazis are quite creative how they count women in those unemployment figures, um, industrial output compared to um, uh, the start rise by six percent, and the, the GMP goes by 40 percent. These are huge numbers, and these are these are triumphed everywhere. And this is undoubtedly to some extent an improvement and success. Um, the thing you need to think about though is number one these improvements are in the context of the great depression so things got really bad and this is evidence of it getting less bad rather than nazis making something particularly and so less bad to go back towards new normal as if uh, as it was before 1929 as opposed to the nazis having some economic genius and seeing something and seeing the matrix and knowing how to do it and so um although um the um these numbers are, are impressive. They're not necessarily sustainable. Uh, you won't be able to keep this on for 10, 20, 30 years because you're only getting these such impressive numbers from the fact that um, the, the, it was so low, the, that, that low starting point from that period in the Great Depression. And in addition, to some extent, really bear in mind that Hitler is you know, partly responsible, Nazi partly responsible. There is much taken advantage of the economic cycle. That, however, does not matter as much because we are looking for the political impact. And the political impact of this program um, is really important. 
Um, Hitler gains a ton of legitimacy and authority from the fact that he is seen as the leader and the propaganda is certainly used to sort of extend this all the public works projects are linked to Hitler and all the sort of gains are linked to Hitler's ideas he is seen as the one who has fixed the Great Depression Germans lived in squalor and fear for four years between 1929 and 1933 and this guy comes up and in about a year and a half um, there's real signs of recovery um, there's a real sense that Hitler, compared to other leaders, knows what he's doing. And this is helped by the fact that, you know, if you remember the Nazis, um, the Germ many German people who voted for Nazis have this idea that leadership needs to be authoritarian. Um, le leadership needs to follow the model of a little bit more of a sort of a strong, less democratic, more, you know, decisive leader in an emergency. And Hitler came in, did decisive stuff as a... Um, well, looks on the surface to like the size of stuff or as a leader, and they see the results. And therefore, this almost hit, falls into their preconceptions about what leadership should be, and therefore, pre preconceptions of why having someone who is a sort of a bit more of a dictator is a good thing for Germany. So, what this does is this really creates a narrative success behind Hitler. Um, the fact that Hitler and the Nazis have improved and this helps many Germans go from suspicion to giving him the benefit of the doubt and to get that consent if we go back to it um, uh, that consent um, here um, the um, uh, all you need is people to say I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt um, to see what you do next and therefore um, what we see it, and what we can argue is this is vital to pr create the myth of Hitler, the myth that Hitler is the man, only man who can save Germany, who can prove it, the, provide the trust in Germany, and therefore the lack of resistance and the, the stability, because Hitler has, uh, compared to everything else, has seen himself as better. If you're going to argue this, please emphasize that a lot of this emphasis goes on Hitler rather than Nazis, but also this is because of the relative experience of 33 to 36 compared to the Great Depression. If you didn't have the Great Depression, the Nazis would look less impressive with these, their sort of economic policy. So, this uh, is absolutely vital to um, help us get that sort of sense, uh, myth of the leader, sense of the uh, authority, blah, 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 um, and so on. Um, this changes a little bit afterwards however as i mentioned uh, in 1936 we had a four-year plan which is the shift to rearmament um, and there becomes something known as the guns or butter dispute should the economy be, be spending its um its uh, efforts on um spending on rearmament so guns or on luxuries i butter um uh, and therefore and there's this complaint that the increasingly emphasis of money time factory time uh, government resources and the priorities of government shift towards making weapons and therefore means that consumers actually fall out their, their, the price of things of consumer goods increase fewer are made there are fewer quality and pay reduces now this is true to an extent but it's better to explain it as a a decline of the trajectory i the they um uh increasingly um uh, find that they aren't pushing any further gains. There is still a slight growth in consumer products, particularly ones which have a propaganda value, such as radios and the Volkswagen, the people's car. Um, but um, we do see a slight shift away from purely focusing on material interest in this period. And this pattern between um, in the next uh, couple of years, between 1939 and 41, and then particularly 42 to 45, only increases as the needs of war increase, the, the ability of the state to um, give the material luxuries, the consumer goods, the, the, that stuff, decrease. And what we can say, therefore, is with that rearmament, um, um, we don't necessarily see the same um, improvements over time. Um, and so what we're going to do is just to finish off, um, uh, before we look at the overall arguments, um, look at some specific facts, both of... Um, uh, in general, and then look at the, some specific groups which shows the variation. Because in reality, like most things in Nazi Germany stability, some groups could be better than others. You can imagine which groups will, i.e. politically powerful ones, um, middle classes, elites, Junkers, um, industrialists, um, whereas some do not do so well. You can imagine who they are. If you've got the bottom of the, pi of the pile, um, middle stand, working classes, and to some extent, peasants. So some key facts first, which are, sort of, which are commonly come up in essay. The first thing you want to point out is rationing, proper rationing, i.e. the limiting of foodstuffs to fight the war, doesn't start until 1943, well after most other countries in World War II had started rationing. Um, 
rationing is a really sensible idea. Um, you're not going to starve people. You give people enough calories to eat, but you just make sure they don't have any more because that's a luxury. Um, Hitler's um, and the Nazis are afraid of making people, so afraid of making people sad by reducing their material circumstances that they hold off rationing. And if you're holding off rationing, that's money and time and food being spent on stuff that you don't need it for. In a war, you should really be maximizing resources for the front, like feeding your soldiers, but also if you are um, in spending um, the limited amount of uh, money that could be being spent on food, on other things which are held the war. Um, we also see that the general theme is that workers, because they're less politically essential, um, and plus they're more desperate for jobs, they're the ones who generally lost their jobs in the Great Depression, not middle classes, um, um, they tend to receive less attention and less um, efforts in their regard. Um, a really good example of where the crossover between material interest and Volksgemeinschaft is, is the Strength Through Joy program. This is the idea that workers can be encouraged to work hard um, by being given nice things in return. So that's holidays, trips and sporting opportunities. Um, by 1938, 180,000 workers have been on cruises and 10 million have been on a state funded holiday. This is a really good example of material interest. This is the Nazis come up, um, join, Nazis are good, they've given me a holiday to the, to the Black Forest, for example. Um, and this is really, um, really encouraged by Hitler to help create the sense of the called posh word for this is state paternalism, um, where the state sort of takes a role, um, sort of looking after people. Um, uh, and this is a really good example of how they're trying to sort of buy people off or buy goodwill or at least buy consent through um, these opportunities here. Um, the next thing is the real effort the state puts into try and make, trying to make sure that certain consumer goods are mass produced and also sold at a loss or at least at cost. For example, the People's Radio, um, as you see when we come to the propaganda session, was massively... Um, uh, rolled out and encouraged um, by Goebbels um, in order to give people access to um, the what was then the equivalent of television I sort of something for recreational use. The Volkswagen um, uh, was also created where you could you could basically get a car by paying a little bit each month, um, five marks a week. Over three hundred thousand uh, Germans had signed up for the Volkswagen before it even even start production. In addition, um, in 1933, the Reich's food estate, is, as we shall see, is really important for regulating food prices and workers' wages. And up until 1936, it had done a real good job of supporting the farmers, i.e. making sure that farm um, food wage prices are high enough to keep the um, farmers' lives at least somewhat pleasant-ish. Um, however, when the... the um, uh, the rearmament happens um, and therefore we need to have factories building stuff more and therefore workers become marginally more important um, it was decided that in order to save money what you'll do is we'll change those wages and therefore change those prices so change those prices essentially if bread costs let's say for saying for the sake of argument 10 marks um, uh, per week uh, per family, you need to make sure your wages are at least 10 marks. If, however, bre bread costs 5 marks per um, week per family, then you only need to make, pay those wages 5 marks. That means you've got more money to spend on guns. Um, and that was the idea. So what, they, what, what the Reich's Food Estate did is from 1953-36, it was while it was a big supporter and big helper of farmers, by the end it's, it starts re slowly reducing the prices to give the farmers a less good deal in order to, to subsidise the wages of um, the um, workers. And so if we look at these sort of inequalities um, across the board in this period, big businesses' incomes increased by 116%, obviously they, they do quite a lot well out the rearmament, farmers 41% and workers 25%. We're seeing that sort of inequality. Between 36 and 39, the Mittelstand reduce in number. Um, uh, despite the fact that the value of the trade they're involved in, i.e. if they, you know, the, the trade that the Mitchell Stands are part of, blacksmithing, um, uh, level working, cobbling, and so on, doubles. I, so there's twice as much economic activity, there's twice as much money being spent on this stuff in this period, but yet the number of people in the industry goes down. Why? They're being squeezed out, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a second, by the big factories and the big businesses. We also see the average paid holidays of Germans um, going up from free to one free free, um, so free in 1933 to 6 to 12 in 1939 and we do see some improvement of living standards which many G Germans see as a sign of progress I it's not enough on its own now but this is quite an impressive sign and I think it's worth buying Hitler to continue this going um, 
and you know the real key th sort of message is how bad this is and the last one was saying well actually there's a bit more variation and that is that variation we're going to talk about next um how bad this is for the average worker in 1936 their wage is 35 marks a week not a huge amount but it's 10 times what they got when they were unemployed in 1932 and many Ger many german workers who have no ideological reason to like the nazis look at this at their sort of improvement in their material situation and at least keep quiet they don't have a love hitter they keep quiet and so these facts can be used to illustrate a range of factors from the first few which shows the improvement uh, to the bottom few which shows the sort of in individual variation and and the fact that the picture is a little bit more complex and in inequality um, this sort of variation is further sort of explained when we look at what's happening in um, uh, Germany across different social groups big business does very well why they remember the elites um, they are also central to rearmament so we see massive Increases in share prices uh, from 41 points uh, on the share index to 106. Salaries, which go up by um, 3,700 Reichsmark to uh, 5,420 Reichsmark. They also do well when um, Germany starts um, taking land um, uh, in World War II. Um, they start, um, but many businesses start getting free, uh, essentially slave labor, French, Jews, and Polish um, individuals, so some Slavs. Um, um, uh, and they also get land, access to lands and businesses and uh, structures and factories and so on. Um, we do see a variation in bigger and smaller businesses. The bigger businesses tend to take the lion's share be of, of the goods because they are a more efficient, um, but also they have they are more likely to know personally the um, uh, the sort of ministers and the various people in the government who give out contracts and therefore they're more likely to sort of get access to big top end contracts and make money off them. Um, we also see some sectors of industrialism do better than others. Those related to war, so that's iron, steel, coal, chemicals and so on, they do better than um, big business which creates stuff like textiles which is less important. So it's not necessarily that all industries do equally well and equally it's perfect. And in some cases where the um, uh, industries really don't play ball, for example um, uh, the owners of the Ruhr which had appeared in the an area in the um, west of Germany um, near the border of France, um, the owners of these sort of coal and iron um, uh, uh, industries refuse to sort of follow some Dictax from Goering, who in 1936, who was acting as the office of the four-year plan, and his response was to nationalise and take over businesses. Now the industrialists, they did get paid for this; they didn't sort of take it off them, and they did get some compensation. Um, but it's again a sign that they, you know, ultimately this, this, there's almost this devil's bargain you have to make in the big business. You do well at the Nazis, but ultimately you've got to make sure you play ball to some extent. In addition, workers, on the other hand, um, because, who are less politically important and less vital for um, the uh, economy per se, but also it's important to some extent to make sure they are at least kept quiet because they are a large group of people by um, buying them um, by making sure their circumstances at least don't get any worse. Um, um, to find themselves um, in a bit of a mixed bag. They are under 50% of the population, so if you want to keep domestic peace, you need to make sure that you keep them at least happy. And so they do benefit from many Volksgemeinschaft policies, such as strength through joy. Um, but their wages are very slow to um, uh, increase with their real wages, i.e. that's how much can you buy with your money as opposed to what number is it, um, only beats the, what the pre-depression um, uh, real wages um, in 1938. Um, and so like, it's very slow growth. Um, there's definitely improvement in unemployment. The unemployment figures are mostly workers and therefore the improvement in unemployment figures are mostly helping workers. Um, but in return for this, their working week increased from 43 hours to 40, 47 hours between 1933 and 39. Um, and in addition, if you are a woman, you are would like to pressure it out of your job. Now, this had two effects. This meant that um, number one, obviously, uh, many women um, did not have an share of good material interest, but it meant that the number of two income households slightly declines. Now, we're going to talk about this in more detail in a future lesson, but essentially, the Nazis, while they um, really want to encourage women not to, to work, they're not very good at making it happen. So the sort of, if we look at the indu urban industrial sphere, um, we see a marked difference in inequality um, in, in incomes and material interests, with a massive improvement for the big businesses and the workers. So big businesses over the workers. Everyone improves, but it's not even. This is mirrored when we look at the sort of more um, uh, sort of uh, provincial groups in society. One quick note on the Junkers: um, when we look at what the peasants 
do in the countryside do you'll notice that a lot of the stuff particularly the first five bullet points particularly benefit the Yunkers and their landed estates. Um, the Yunkers do very well out of government service, military service, with the pay increases, provision increases, and um, they do very well out of protections, what we're about to talk about. Um, so, although this is labelled as peasants, you think it's more as much countryside. Um, so, the peasants and the rural people in the rural areas like the idea that, like, often like the fact that the Nazis were all about that Volk ideal, the idea that we need to move people away from the cities, which you know, breeds cowards in their opinion, um, more towards the countryside. And there is increasing tariffs. This is where you tax foreign imports. So food is increasingly tariffed to inc to help rise prices. So if American corn is produ is produced really cheaply, I need to put a tax on it when it's being imported to make it more expensive than our German corn so people buy German corn. That's a good way of making sure people buy your corn and therefore keeping your prices high. Um, in addition, when they came to power, many farms, including Juncker farms, because they were living a lifestyle which um, uh, demanded a certain amount of money to be spent, but there's not that much money in farming as time goes on, um, many farm debts and mortgages um, are written off. What that means is um, the government says you don't have to pay them back. And this is a real good show of goodwill to many sort of medium sized farms. Who gets this is often um, varies. Um, it often depends you, if you apply for it. So if obviously if you're in the know and if you're literate and you know the right people, it matters more. So obviously there are, there's a fair few uh, educated Junkers and small and less than ability to benefit from this. But a, a large number of small farmers also benefit from this. In addition, they have low interest loans and tax allowances given to them. Um, uh, in order to, um, and these tax allowances are about per hectare, so per area of land. So it's everyone, um, depending on how big your farm is, depend gives you how much tax allowance. So obviously, if you own a big farm, you get a lot of a tax allowance. Um, and so again, it's to try and promote these farmers to invest with the loans and also give them more breathing room in terms of being able to afford a decent lifestyle at the same time as um, uh, making food, which is something which is under. Um, requirements and the Reich's food estate in 1933 as mentioned is really important to help set prices a little bit higher to make sure that there's at least a living standard available for smaller farmers and profit to be made for the bigger farmers um, the important thing to realize is that it's not perfect though as I mentioned before in 1936 in order to prioritize the rearmament to make um, workers wages um, workers work hard and also mean you don't have to pay them as much um, food prices were adjusted so the food prices were gra gradually reduced and therefore those, those gains in income start disappearing. In addition, the rights food effect is for medals um, a lot, tells farmers exactly a lot about how they do their job, what they should do and how they should do it, often without much information themselves. And that creates quite a lot of resentment increasingly about the rights food estate um, uh, in this period. And it's therefore, although you know there is a grudging acceptance of it by the end, you know it's, it's early years, everyone loves it disappears and life in the countryside still is uh, still not great but evidenced by the fact that we see three percent of the population of germany go from um, the countryside to the cities in between 1928 and 38 um, again if, if the situation it does not stem that sort of flow of people um, moving from one side um, one sector to the other so clearly life is still not brilliant in this period and to finish off, uh, the final group I want to talk about, which is sort of unique um, beyond the sort of big picture stories I've been saying across the board and the things to remember and the general improvement, is the Mittelstand. Mittelstand, if you remember, the lower middle classes. Those are the small business owners, particularly, who um, have a trade, artisans, they're often called. They were initially given low interest loans. And they were initially um, supported by something called the Law to Protect the Retail Trade in 1933. And this is basically said that big department stores, i.e. competitions for their small shops, were banned. And those which were, um, uh, were already existed, so banned from any making any new ones, those which already existed were increasingly taxed to make them less um, competitive and make their rise their prices. This was helped by the fact that many department stores were, by not, um, were owned by Jews, which helped encourage Nazis to do it. In addition, there were loads, quite a large number of regulations designed to set prices and help um, provide um, uh, Mitchell Stand with an equal playing field against the bigger businesses. But in reality, these regulations got nowhere near. If you've got a massive factory of huge amounts of low paid workers, great with huge machines, um, you can buy the resources in bulk, you're always going to be cheaper than Mitchell Stand. And so th what this ended up doing is at the very best stemming the marked decline of the Mitchell Stand. Um, 
this is not helped by the fact that the Nazis really cozy up to big business and big business are the rivals of the Mittelstand. Um, and therefore, um, uh, although there are these sort of tokenistic gestures which Mittelstand like, and actually they quite they think are preferable, the Nazis clearly don't take saving the Mittelstand seriously enough to sort of limit the power of um, big business and the industrialists from um, uh, acting as rivals. And so therefore we see a real decline in the number of um, people in the Mittelstand. Um, there's about roughly 10% reduction in numbers in 36 to 39. Um, and also the population is ageing. So um, the... Um, uh, in 1933, we have 20% of people who are Michel Stand are under 30 and 40% are over 60. And we see that population get older as fewer people enter the Michel Stand professions. And so therefore the average age um, goes up. And so therefore 10% becomes under 30 and 19% is over 60. And so clearly the Michel Stand continue their sort of precipitous decline that's been happening since about the 1880s. Um, the Nazis not caring enough because it costs them rearmament to deal with the big business side of stuff. Um, so th while this sort of general story of improvement balanced by rearmament, balanced by sort of variations is true for everyone, the stuff we've looked at allows you to provide, show there's a bit more variation, a bit more exceptions, um, a bit more complexity to the story without having to go into too much detail. Broadly, big business does well, um, so long as they play the line. Workers do just enough to keep them quiet. Um, the peasants have a real effort made against them, but as we see a shift towards rearmament, increasingly do poorly, and the middle stand get lip service, but not much else. Um, so in total, how is this going to be helpful for them to improve um, popular, um, secure their popularity? I would contend material interest is absolutely vital to secure popularity or at least secure stability. The Nazis are untrested, untried, with no reputation, well, with, huge reputation, with no experience in office, but no, no, nothing for people to understand how they are when they're in office. The fact that they managed to recover, regardless or not if it was their responsibility, the fact that they were thanked for recovering um, the um, uh, from the Great Depression, help give them a narrative of success, help them give a sense that Nazis can improve. And therefore meant that many people who are, who are initially quite suspicious of Nazis were willing to give the Nazis a go um, for, in future. And this actually carries on well into World War II. There's a sense that Hitler must have a plan. And in particular, this really hits, it feeds into that Hitler myth. Um, the, the fact that um, uh, uh, essentially without the sense that Hitler has improved the impression, it's really hard to have a sense of the Hitler myth. So if you, um, the Hitler myth is, a, you must have successes. The most important thing for people in Germany at, during the Great Depression is the economy. If Hitler could not fix the economy, he would not have a Hitler myth. And therefore we could say, this is vital to feed into the Hitler myth, but without this um, improvement, you wouldn't have a Hitler myth. It is necessary for, um, to have the Hitler myth to work. Um, when, however, we could also say to some extent, what this does is generate consent. It generates people to go, you know what, I'll go along with you, rather than object loyalty that people never question. We could say, therefore, economic prosperity is far more of a condition. You need to ha improve the economy to stay in power, as opposed to a thing that people love him forever for. Um, and therefore, if the material interest declines, you would also see supply support the masses decline. And this is quite clear by the fact that Nazis are always desperate to keep certain groups happy, um, reduce rationing, and so on. Um, in addition, you could argue that, the, as you meant, if you remember when we looked at the terror lesson, something called the broader network of support, the fact that the Nazis have increased control over the economy through their policies on material interest, for example, owning the rights through the state, for example, having a role of big business by signing up contracts, um, and so on, um, that gives them leverage. That gives them an ability to get in people's lives. That gives them an ability to have something to hold over people, to threaten them into conforming. And therefore, you can argue to some extent it gives them, um, a, contributes, helps contribute to terror because it means that Nazis have a, that broader terror network apparatus we were talking about in that terror lesson. Um, an important thing we should think about, perhaps in this question, is how imp um, whether. Um, this question is different for a recovery or lack of recovery. Um, the um, the during the recovery, it's very I think it's very hard to argue anything other than that it really helped the Nazis. But after recovery, particularly as the war starts going badly, you can say, well, material interest, as you're being bombed by the RS and the Russians are coming, it's quite hard to say that people think that their material circumstances are a bit of luxury. Um, and therefore, perhaps the, the factors that in those later periods which keep people loyal are different to ones in the early years, which are far more based on look at him, he fixed the impression we should like him. Um, and therefore, let's really move away from this idea that like, just because you've got money means people love him. Um, economic stability is, is one of those things where people need to keep them happy. It, it, 
if, if people people notice a lack of stability and prosperity a lot more than they notice the fact they have stability and prosperity i and to some extent, it's something which keeps people quiet. If people have a good time, if people go well, if things go well, people are happy, therefore people are quiet. And therefore, we can argue that to some extent, um, the um, role of material interest is to find that, provide that baseline, that baseline thing which doesn't aggravate people, doesn't make people sad, and encourages people to, to some extent, conform. Um, a very important thing to realize is not everyone gains um, in this period not everyone makes makes um, economic growth but the vast majority stay pliant the workers for example do not gain very much the farmers do not gain as much particularly after 1936 which sometimes not gain very much over time but yet most of these people do not re rebel resist so clearly it can't be just material interest on its own because those groups who don't necessarily improve still do not get still um, stay quiet so if I'm going to summarise in about two sentences the impact of material interest, I'd say we want to describe it as a machine, a mechanism to manufacture consent, to generate consent for the regime by creating a sense of competency and stability, which the German people desire particularly after the um, Great Depression. And therefore, this is vital to create that Hitler myth and that narrative success, but something where if Hitler suddenly just stopped giving all this stuff and stopped improving the economy, he could very, very quickly find himself in trouble. Okay, next session, we're going to look at one of the other factors. Until then, um, good luck.